Thank you. And at your tables, there's uh, cards. If uh, you'd like to see a more extensive video next year when you all come back, there's an opportunity to increase your commitments to the New England Patriots Charitable Foundation. There's cards at your table. You can fill it out, leave it here, and um, we appreciate it. Give what you can, but really we appreciate you coming tonight. Uh, my father in the video had mentioned a program that uh, we're very proud of at the Patriots Foundation, the Community MVP Awards. And over the last seven years, we've recognized close to 150 volunteers from throughout New England, all six states, as well as the nonprofit they volunteer with, at uh, for their compassion, their passion, and their commitment to the nonprofit they're at. Um, you know, through the years, it's been a person like Tony Hayter, who the North Providence Boys and Girls Club was a swim coach for years, and uh, he won the award in his last year of coaching with uh, terminal lung cancer. He coached this whole season from the pool deck in a wheelchair on oxygen. And if any of you have been in one of those pools, you know how humid it is. So it's people like that and people like our next speaker, Dick Sear, from David's house at, uh, in, up in New Hampshire. Uh, David's house is for fa uh, it's a place for families to stay, a supportive place when their loved ones are being treated at the Children's Hospital up at Dartmouth University. And David's house was named for Dick's adopted son, David, who passed away from cancer. So I'm going to call Dick up to say a few words. Good evening, everybody. I've been asked to tell you a story that's 30 years old in five minutes or less. I'll try my best. In December of 1979, I was visiting an emergency foster home in Heartland, Vermont, where I met a child, 10 months old, who was battered and malnourished. He had been living in a car. I was 43 years old, had no intentions of raising a second family, but I went home that night and I couldn't get that little boy out of my mind. And the next day I went to White River Junction, Vermont, to social services and asked if I could take David to our house to give the state enough time to find a good and proper home for the little boy named David. And permission was granted. We took David home. A month later, his nightmares diminished. He started to respond to human kindness and I wanted to adopt him. <clears throat> I thought from the battering and the malnourishment that he would have brain damage, but it turned out just to be the opposite. He was a very brilliant child. <clears throat> At the age of 22 months old, he was diagnosed with acute lymphatic leukemia, and for the next three and a half years, we spent an awful lot of time at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center with David. During that time, I met many people who were sleeping in their cars. They came from pretty much all over New England, but also from all over the world, and there was no place for them to stay. David, in the meantime, was running around that hospital making friends and making sure that children that were there without parents, he would bring them to our room and he would kind of adopt them. Over David's short lifetime, he, uh, whenever he was given any money, he hid it all over our house <clears throat> and uh, never spent a penny. And when I asked him what he was saving it for, he said, for a special reason, Dad. <clears throat> In June of 1984, Dr. Neil Carnell, David's oncologist, called me into his office to tell me that David only had a few months to live. He was in his eighth relapse. <clears throat> we had been told that twice before, but this time I knew that David really was going to go. So I asked Dr. Cornell why we didn't have a home for these families, and he said that attempts had been made for 10 years and nothing happened, and I blurted out, we're going to build a house and call it David's house. David died on September 8th of 1984, and the first money to go into building that house was his money <clears throat> that I found all over the house. We have housed well over...
We have housed well over 12,000 families from 20 foreign countries in 43 states. In New England, I'm very nervous. From the state of Maine, we've housed 240 families. And these families stay with us from four days to a year. New Hampshire, over 7,000 families. Vermont, 2,284. Massachusetts, 280. Rhode Island, 24. Connecticut, 71. When these families come to uh, Lebanon, New Hampshire, a lot of them don't know that David's house is there and they think it's going to be like the old days when they slept in their cars or in a chair in the corner of a room. Or if the child had a twin bed, maybe there was room enough for mom there. <clears throat> but that doesn't happen anymore. We, are, we can house 15 families at a time. Over the past year, we've been full, full, and we've had to turn people away. And now we're thinking about putting on another addition, another four bedrooms. Um, when I got the MVP award, I also received the check from the Kra family and your foundation for $10,000. Part of that money is being spent on a feasibility study to build that addition. In this economy, we're not sure, but we know we can do it. We always have in the past. So for all of you here tonight, um, I'm just a small part <coughs> of what happens in New England. And some of the people I met the day I got that award are very outstanding people. And to the Kraft family, in your generous heart, and all the patriots, and everybody in this room, thank you so much. <laughs> Round of applause for Dick Sear, please.